Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Northrop Frye's Conclusion to a Literary History of Canada, which I'm reading out of Bushgart collection of Frye's essays. So this piece, the conclusion uh, to, to a literary history of Canada, um, this is probably one of the most important theoretical pieces in in the study of Canadian literature. Um, what Fry is interested in is this idea of the cultural imaginary, uh, and this is linked to cultural history, which for Canada, according to Fry, I, I do want to say this at the beginning, I'm going to come back to this later, this piece originally, uh, A Literary History of Canada, was published in 1965. So, uh, up to that point, Canadian cultural history, Canadian culture, was very much derived from British culture and very heavily influenced by U.S. culture. It's a kind of weird hybrid that, that also has its own specific cultural components. Um... But Fry has this, this idea that he develops of the cultural imaginary. Um, basically, what he says here of cultural history specifically, the thing that informs the cultural imaginary, he says, like other kinds of histories, it has its own themes of exploration, settlement, and development, but these themes relate to a social imagination that explores and settles and develops, and the imagination has its own rhythms of growth as well as its own modes of expression. So basically what he's interested here with the idea of the cultural imaginary is the idea that the particular context, the particular elements of a society produce a particular way of looking at the world, but also a way of thinking, oh, a way of thinking the self. And what I mean by that basically is a way, it, it develops a way in which people within that culture, within that society, come to understand the world around them and how it impacts them. And what Fry argues is that Canada has a very distinct cultural imaginary, which is rooted in what he calls the garrison mentality. And this is where it gets really important for, for the, the history of Canadian literature. Um, Fry argues that this is the defining characteristic that has shaped not only the content and the focus of Canadian literature, but that has also prevented Canada, up to 1965 at least, from producing great works of literature. So, uh, the garrison mentality, basically, long story short, um, this is a sort of existential terror of the wilderness. Right, and this is a this is a thing that you see very often in frontier literatures. Like, if you for it, it, a real, I think really some really good examples of this is um, you look back to like Puritan New England, early colonial New England. There's a lot of texts in which the wilderness outside of the the, the Puritan village or town is this sort of terrifying existential threat. And we can we see that even today in uh what is it, Roger Roger I can't I can't remember the director of the movie. Um The Witch, um set in Puritan New England, right? Uh, we see this in in these historical films in which the forest or the woods is a is a, a space of terror. So what Fry says here is first off he says i've long been impressed in canadian poetry but this is true in fiction and and creative nonfiction as well he argues by a tone of deep terror in regard to nature a theme to which we shall return 
It is not a terror of the dangers or discomforts or even the mysteries of nature, but a terror of the soul at something that these things manifest. So in other words, the, the wilderness is not scary because it poses physical dangers. There's bears and wolves and snakes and you can fall off a cliff or you can be walking across a frozen pond and it can give way and you can die, all these things. No, that's not what's terrifying about the wilderness. What's terrifying is a kind of existential threat that it poses to humanity as such. The contrast to this is the garrison, the out, the human outpost within the existentially dreadful space of nature. So he says here, If we put together a few of these impressions, that's all the stuff he's been talking about, about how nature functions and sort of conservatism, a sort of centralization, cultural homogeneity in, in Canadian literature. He says, if we put together a few of these impressions, we may get some approach to characterizing the way in which the Canadian imagination has developed in its literature. Small and isolated communities surrounded with a physical or psychological frontier, separated from one another and from their American and British cultural sources. Communities that provide all that their members have in the way of distinctly human values, and that are compelled to feel a great respect for the law and order that holds them together, yet confronted with a huge, unthinking, menacing, and formidable physical setting, such communities are bound to develop what we may provisionally call a garrison mentality. And so, what Fry argues in terms of the characteristics of this garrison mentality, this is very much a centralized society. Everything revolves around this particular space of physical, but also psychological or existential safety. Uh, this is very much a an ordered society in order for the garrison to survive against the existential threat posed by the wilderness, everybody has to stay in line. This is a law and order society, in other words. Um, and, and many people have made this observation. Canadians tend to Canadians are more likely than Americans, for instance, to be deferential to authority. Uh, Canadians are less likely, likely to challenge their leaders. They're less likely to challenge um, their bosses at work. They're less likely to challenge teachers in school, things like this. Uh, whereas Americans are, are much more imbued with a sort of anti-authoritarian cultural imaginary. Um, and Fry argues that the particular historical and, and socio-cultural developments of Canada have contributed to that. This sense that you stay in line, you do as you're told, and that's how, as a society, you remain existentially safe. This is also, in the garrison mentality, a society that is rooted in I don't want to say reality, because that suggests that other societies are not rooted in reality. Reporting. So, the, the undercurrent, the literary undercurrent of, um, of Canadian literature, according to Fry, is this sort of fact-based encounter with the world. One writes their experience. And that experience stands on its own. This is in contrast to great literary traditions where one explores the nature of existence, the boundaries of the human, what it means to be a person on this rock spinning through space, etc., etc. And these things have these kind of universal themes. They are literature as opposed to anecdotes, in a way. Um, and, and so this is one of the things that Fry argues, is that 
the defensiveness of the garrison mentality, the uniformity, the regimentation of the garrison mentality has severely stunted the Canadian literary imagination and Canadian literary output. Um, he argues that this is the dominant trend in Canadian literature, and it is worth mentioning this is Anglophone Canadian literature, or sp more specifically Anglo-Canadian literature by white English-speaking Canadians. Um, so he argues this is the dominant trend, at least up through World War I, and then as you get into the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, you do have kind of a shift where people start developing a pastoral imagination. But what Fry argues is that this pastoral imagination is still fundamentally shaped by the garrison mentality in that it is a reaction to it. So rather than, say, English or U.S. pastoral poetry um, in which nature is on sort of in, on its own merits a space of peace, harmony, uh, existential wholeness, etc., etc. The pastoral imagination in the Canadian tradition is a kind of inversion of the typical garrison mentality because nature comes to represent a, a sort of space of freedom and existential truth and society comes to figure as the wilderness that threatens the individual. So it's still, according to Fry, shaped by the garrison mentality and this sense that there is a there is a compact space where I am safe and all outside threatens. Now, I mentioned that this was published in 1965. That's incredibly important from the perspective of, say, 2023 when I'm filming this. Um, one element of this is Fry claims that there has not been a, a, a tradition of classic literature in Canada, that, that the literature is in some way very limited in its sort of scope, its quality, its, its overall meaningfulness in some way. And I think that's probably changed since then. Um, Canada has undergone significant changes since 1965. Uh, and Canadian letters have really, really come a long way. And I would argue that maybe people like Margaret Atwood or uh, Michael Andate would be would be very popular, popularly known candidates for people who have produced maybe great Canadian novels. Um, but also, Fry says that almost no Canadian writers up to that point had produced multiple good books. And today that's clearly not the case. I mean, again, Atwood and Andate would be, would be great counterexamples of this because they each have multiple very, very successful books. Um, Anne-Marie MacDonald would be another one. The other element of this that I think is important in terms of, of 1965 is... Fry is talking again about Anglo-Canadians here, white, English-speaking Canadians. He does talk a little bit about how the garrison mentality seems to be present in Francophone Canadians with some slight variations based on their distinct cultural history within Anglophone Canada. But indigenous people are in a very sort of weird peripheral space here where they get mentioned a few times, but they really aren't part of the literary tradition that Fry is discussing. And of course, by 2023, the scope of Canadian letters, the scope of who is considered a Canadian author and even a, an important Canadian author has expanded significantly to include not just Indigenous Canadians, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, etc., etc., um, but also 
African Canadians, Caribbean Canadians, South Asian Canadians, um, East Asian Canadians, Middle Eastern Asian Canadians, um, and, and of course, a lot more female authors, a lot more LGBT authors, um, etc., etc. So, the scope of Canadian literature as a field has expanded and, and become significantly more complex since 1965, at which point still the, the dominant literary traditions, writing traditions in Canada were either French or Anglophone Canadian literature written by white Canadians, um, mostly of English, Irish, Scottish, etc. descent. 